Good evening. There we go. I'm Christine Hurley, director of the speaker series at the Institute of Politics, and thank you so much for joining us on such a beautiful evening. Uh, we're pleased to welcome this distinguished panel to campus for a conversation on the American public school system. A special thank you to Secretary John King, who has uh, this quarter been a IOP Pritzker Fellow. And for any students in the audience, feel free to come to any of his seminars, which are every Tuesday. Some upcoming events. Uh, this Thursday, we have two of the nation's most effective political organizers coming to campus, Ai-jen Poo and George Gol. They're going to come and discuss their careers, strategies, and the most pressing organizing challenges of our time. Next Monday, we're hosting a conversation on the war in Yemen. And next Wednesday, we're uh, welcoming former U.S. Ambassador for Russia, William Burns. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website, politics.uchicago.edu. As usual, we're going to open up the floor to questions. You're going to form a line uh, behind the microphone, which will be in the center aisle. We do give priority to the first three questions to come from students. And a friendly reminder that a question ends in a question mark. Um, a few house housekeeping notes. Um, please make sure that your phones are on silent or off. Uh, restrooms are downstairs. And now to here to formally introduce uh, our panel is Devshi Marotra. Devshi is a fourth year from Irvine, California, studying computer science. During her time at UChicago, she has participated in civic engagement programs such as Seeds of Justice and the Sergeant Shriver program. This year, she's a senior chair of the Student Advisory Board at the IOP. Please welcome Devshi to the podium. Hello, everyone. Our country's public education system holds a very special place in the hearts of most Americans. After all, most of us have either personally benefited from the system or have friends or family members who have. Perhaps even more importantly, America's investment in its public education represents a belief that each and every child, irrespective of their race, gender, or socioeconomic background, has the right to pursue a meaningful and fulfilling life for themselves. Today's conversation will touch on some of the most pressing policy implementation challenges that are facing the public education system today. Each and every one of our panelists has worked tirelessly in their respective communities to not only address these issues, but to do so from a perspective that's centered on equity and justice. Dr. Janice Jackson currently serves as CEO of the Chicago Public School System. Her relationship with CPS extends far back as she personally was a student in the K through 12 system here in the city of Chicago. Since then, Dr. Jackson has served as a teacher, a principal, network chief, chief education officer, and now CEO of the country's third largest school district. Over the course of her tenure, Dr. Jackson has led a variety of different initiatives which have propelled CPS students to record high graduation rates of 77.3%. Dr. John King is the president of the Education Trust, a national nonprofit organization which works towards ensuring that students of color and those experiencing poverty have all the means necessary to be able to excel academically. He has led a celebrated career in both federal and state education, having formerly served as U.S. State um, Secretary of Education under the Obama administration. He also served as New York State Education Commissioner. This quarter, Dr. King is a Pritzker Fellow at the Institute of Politics. Mr. Pedro Martinez currently serves as Superintendent of the San Antonio Independent School District. Upon coming into office, Mr. Martinez made it a priority to address issues of multi-generational poverty, and he did so by embarking on a bold school integration program. As his classrooms have become more diverse over the course of his tenure, we've seen student achievement and graduation rates also begin to rise. Prior to his time in San Antonio, Mr. Martinez was the chief financial officer here in CPS. Today's conversation will be moderated by our very own IOP Executive Director, Ms. Gretchen Crosby Sims. And with that, thank you very much, and I ask for your help in welcoming our panelists to the stage. I feel like I can't see you. Thank you, Devshi. I really appreciate that. 
Um, this is a very special um, conversation for me to moderate. I am the daughter of a public school teacher. I married a public school teacher. I'm the mom of um, children who have been through the Chicago public school system. And it, it really is an honor to be with the three of you who, as Deb, she said, have worked tirelessly and so successfully mm -hmm. on behalf of students across America, and especially some of our least well-served students. So we want to um, jump in. I would like to ask you, John, to paint a picture for us about the performance of America's schools overall. Um, how are our schools, how are, how are American students doing compared to the rest of the world and compared to where they were, say, five or 10 years ago? As you asked in your seminar the other day, what grade would you give them and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, so first, thank you all for coming tonight for what I, I'm sure will be a good conversation about education policy in the United States. I, I, I guess where I'd start is with some good news which is that we have made a lot of progress over the last decade. We have the highest graduation rate from high school we've ever had as a country at 84%. Uh, we have more students in quality pre-K than ever before as a country. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, we see some progress in African American and Latino students going on to college in larger numbers than a decade ago. That is good. The problem is our progress is pretty marginal compared to our international competitors who are making much more progress more quickly. And that is a reason to be quite worried about our international standing. Consider that the United States was once first in the world in college completion. We are now something like 12th or 13th. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we are losing ground, it's because our international competitors are making up ground much more quickly than we are. Consider that we have a 30 to 40 point achievement gap for African American and Latino students, whether you look at state test scores, at SAT and ACT, whether you look at college matriculation or college completion, we have these huge gaps. And yet, today, a majority of the kids in the nation's public schools are kids of color. A majority of the kids in the nation's public schools are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. So, if we fail to educate low-income students of color effectively, mm -hmm. we have no future as a country. Our democracy has no future. Our economy has no future. So there's reasons to feel like we're making progress, and there's a lot of reason to be worried that we're not making progress quickly enough mm -hmm. and equitably enough. And that's really our challenge. So it's hard to give a grade because we do have places that are an A, that are providing mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. opportunities mm -hmm. to kids. But the truth is, we have a lot of kids who are getting a D quality mm -hmm. education. And so we have yeah. this, in truth, kind of bimodal distribution of educational opportunity in the United States. And that is not sustainable for the long term. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly why, in a conversation about Amer how America's schools are doing, we wanted to spotlight two urban superintendents mm -hmm. in particular, because the challenges are greater there. It's not that the kids are any less talented, it's that they have greater violence and poverty and lack of resources. Um, so I guess I, I want to ask uh, each of you, Janice and Pedro, to just paint a very quick picture um, of your districts in terms of how many students, how many low income, what's the funding per pupil, and what have the performance trend lines in your own districts look like? Okay. I'll let Pedro go first. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, so originally from Chicago, graduated from Benito Juarez High School, started my career in K-12 in Chicago, and now in San Antonio, we serve about 50,000 students. Uh, what's interesting about our district, it is, uh, San Antonio is known as the most segregated city in the country based on wealth. And if you go to my city, uh, and if you just don't go to just the tourist areas, don't go just to the Riverwalk, but go to the neighborhoods, my neighborhoods don't have sidewalks. A lot of them don't have internet infrastructure. Um, and so, in a sense, what happened in San Antonio is the city was allowed to annex. So instead of investing in the, in the center of the city, uh, they, they just annexed. And so all the poverty stood in one area. So the way I describe it is imagine if the poorest areas of the city of Chicago were united in one district. That's what happened in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So we have about 50,000 students. Over 90% are free and reduced lunch eligible, which, by the way, is an outdated measure. So we developed our own measure using census data where we look at median income. We look at whether the family is a two-parent household or a single-parent household. 53% of my parents are single-parent households, including 8% dads. 97% um, Latino and African-American. 
Uh, also, we look at whether uh, my families own their own home or whether they rent. I have the highest one of the highest mobility rates in the country because most of my families move from one apartment to another. And we look at the educational level of the adults. Many of my family households, uh, many of the adults are illiterate. Uh, they didn't even graduate from high school. So we went from being one of the lowest performing districts in Texas to now, I, I've been there now four years, the Commissioner of Education has, has said that San Antonio ISD is now one of the fastest improving districts in the entire state of Texas. We've more than doubled uh, college readiness rates. I have record levels. 85% of my kids are now graduating. 90% are applying to college. I'm still pushing. I have a, a lot of fights with families around. I get them into tier one universities like U of C. I get them uh, and the families don't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. And so I have, I'm having uh, discussions all the time with families about letting their young ladies leave, the, leave San Antonio, leave the state. I now have uh, 300 kids that literally go on college trips every, uh, all over the country. One of my, uh, real quick stories, one of my valedictorians of my poorest high school, high school very similar to the one I went to, wouldn't go to a college trip. We just would not let, we were on her back the whole time. Finally, she went, got her into Smith full ride, and this mm -hmm. should be attending next fall. That's great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay, picture yeah. the district. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you probably are very familiar with Chicago Public Schools. Um, as you stated in the introduction, we're the third largest school district in the country. Um, we have about 360,000 students, 660 schools, um, like uh, Pedro's district, majority African American and Latino. Uh, majority of our students come from low income households. We're at about 82% which is actually a bit on the decline. Um, if you made a comparison as we were talking backstage to 10 or 20 years ago, I'm um, in CPS. The transformation of Chicago public schools has been talked about a lot. Um, we are very proud of the progress that we've made, seeing record high um, graduation rates, but also more and more of our students matriculating into college and successfully completing college. Um, on every single metric, and you know, we don't have to go through all of them, but yeah. there are some that we're very proud of, like our college um, uh, matriculation and um, attainment. Um, in graduation rates, our kids are really buying into what we're selling as a school district. And as a result, we're seeing um, much more progress. And, you know, John talked about the graduation rate for the United States. CPS has been identified as actually one of the drivers. We're actually improving our graduation rate faster than any other school system in the country. You know, we were recognized um, by multiple universities for the performance that's happening in our district with regard to growth. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we're focused on, um, similar to just to underscore your point, is around equity um, in order for us to meet our goals, the goals that we've just recently outlined in our five-year vision for the district. We won't meet those goals unless we have a serious conversation about the achievement gap between African-American students in particular and their peers, but even our Latinx students compared to their um, counterparts throughout the city. So there are a lot of positive things happening. We're really excited, but um, we're not going to spike the ball at the 20-yard line. We still have a lot of work to do in order to be, um, you know, uh, to feel like the work is done. And like uh, most leaders of um, urban school systems, we face a lot of similar challenges, which I'm sure we're going to dive into today. But the way that our district approaches this work and my personal philosophy is really around making sure that there are more opportunities and that we're better stewards of the resources that we have. I think that there are some constraints financially that, that we can talk about, but I also think that there are some opportunities that we have an obligation to leverage that can really change the trajectory for many of our students. And so if you look at what CPS has done, people ask us, you know, what's the story behind the transformation? I would say a lot of that has to do with us taking advantage of those opportunities and trying to make sure that kids who weren't otherwise um, exposed to those opportunities are now getting them as a matter of regular course and not, you know, some one-off exception. So I don't want to oversimplify because it is so complex and you both have complex plans of all the different things you're doing. Yeah. Um, but if there were one thing that whenever the time comes when you have to move on, you could have accomplished, what's your top priority and, and why have you been focused on that? Mm -hmm. Janice, go ahead. Uh, I would say um, we started talking about this a little bit backstage, but 
for me, I mean, there are so many things to accomplish. Number one, trying to build on some of the things that we've done so well. Um, one is uh, post-secondary as the North Star in Chicago Public Schools. I think we are a leader in the nation. People look at the work that we've done around college access, um, you know, starting with our freshman on track work and the connection to graduation. So those things we will continue to do because they're working. The focus on principles, the use of data, the accountability systems, I think those things are working. Um, when I leave, though, there's one equity issue that doesn't get talked about a lot. It, it's not as attractive as some of these other things, and it really is access to high-quality curriculum. And so one of the things that we're working on um, as a school system is ensuring that every single school has access to high-quality curriculum from pre-K through high school um, so that teachers are not spending all of their time creating or recreating things that already exist and instead spending much more of their time teaching, looking at student work, et cetera. So during my time here, I want to make sure that the algebra class in, you know, Pilsen is equivalent to the algebra class in Lakeview, and we're just simply not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, Pedro, I asked a San Antonio civic leader for a local level take on how the district is doing under your leadership. And this is a Democrat, for what it's worth. <laughs> this person said, my sense is he is great, but facing the great headwinds of all public schools, declining attendance, awful boards, and unbending teachers unions. He has real vision and is making great change, but getting resistance from all quarters. Agree or disagree? So I, I've been very, I have an elected school board, seven board members. Um, and it's interesting, when I first met them, um, you know, Three were, you know, said the district is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Three said everything is broken. Um, you know, don't trust anybody you meet. And, and one was sort of in the middle. And, and fast forward now four years, we pushed a lot of changes very fast. Uh, I was very blessed that the community was ready for those changes. And one of the things I've learned being in San Antonio, uh, just like when I was here in Chicago with Arnie Duncan, a community can absorb change so much. There's a limit, and as a leader, you have to identify that. I was very blessed that San Antonio was ready for the changes, mm -hmm. just like I would argue even when I was with Arnie, uh, for the most part, the community was ready for a lot of the big changes that were made in Chicago. And I've had a 7-0 board vote since I started, and we've done some tough decisions. I have pushed a lot of special interest groups because one of my comments that I made is that when I started, one of the things that I identified was that everybody everybody had an advocate except for one group of people. That was my students. Mm -hmm. And so because of that and because I saw the children and I saw myself in them, because I grew up here in inner city Chicago, I grew up poor, my, my dad worked two jobs all of his life. I was, it was in a time when this district was tracking kids, you know, that's, that changed, yeah. you know, uh, later on. And, but, it, you know, I was one of the lucky kids that got tracked in the, in the right track. Um, I was in an honors program, even though we had no AP classes in Benito Juarez. And so for me, um, I always reflect on that time. And I started with 700 freshmen, and only uh, 170 of us graduated. Half of us went to college. I still, to this day, look for everybody that went to Benito Juarez with me in those years. And so when I look at my kids, I said, you know what? I'm not going to let this happen to our students mm -hmm. in San Antonio. Um, and I'll tell you, the improvements have been, you know, academically, we're at our best place we've ever been in a couple of decades. I'm keeping my top performing teachers more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, I, can ha I can, out of 100 schools, I can count on my fingers how many principals I feel are, are, you know, are not performing where they should be. And a lot of them are outing themselves because we've raised expectations so much. Mm -hmm. But it is tough. And, and there are, I won't lie to you, I, I'm lucky that I have an 8-year-old and a 5-year-old and a very supportive wife. I'm glad my kids can't read Facebook because the comments that are made about me by the union are very ugly, uh, very racist. But at the end, um, you know, I have to sleep at night and I have to know that the reason I chose to do this work is to fight for these kids. I know Janice is doing the same thing. Yeah. I know John, that's been your history. Um, that's what the work is. And it's not, by the way, it's not very pleasant, folks. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the time, you know, it's, it's very rough work. But I'll tell you, Every time, you know, every time I'm feeling down, I just go to a school, I talk to the students, and the students are the ones that tell me, you know what, you still need to do more, mm -hmm. and they're, they're very challenging, like, you need to do more, you need to help more of us pass the SAT, we gotta be college ready in the SAT, you preach that to us, but they feel like we're going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, John, you've had such a unique perspective uh, working at the local level, the state level, at the federal level, and now at Education Trust, which is an extraordinary organization, both for the policy work that it does and also in the work that it does working with districts and with leaders 
to sort of spotlight best practices and use a very data informed lens on the recommendations that you're making about what school leaders should do. Um, you've cycled through several reform fads and areas of emphasis, and I'm just curious, um, from where you sit now, what are you what are you feeling like the most the couple of highest priority levers are for urban superintendents to focus on? Yeah, well, you know, school really comes down to the interaction between a teacher and and her students and the work in which they are engaged. Right, that's what school mm -hmm. is. And so, eighty to ninety percent of what we spend in school districts is spent on people. The strength of our educator workforce determines the strength of our school system. You're not going to have a school system that, that is better yeah. than the quality of people that you have. And so we've got to focus intensely on preparing teachers to teach effectively, supporting them, compensating them well, providing them with good professional development, providing them with opportunities to grow and improve throughout their career. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, whether it's district level change or individual schools that are working well, it's always good people. It's good teachers, good principals. Yeah. Uh, good, good teachers want to work for good principals. Mm -hmm. Good teachers don't want to work for bad principals. I've never been to a good school with a bad principal. Uh, just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Principals play a critical role in yeah. defining the organizational culture and in giving teachers the support that they need. So the work on people, I would put at the top of the list, mm -hmm. but the work in which they're engaged matters tremendously. Yeah. Janice's point about curriculum is exactly right. Uh, we have to make sure that the work teachers are doing with students is high quality work that will prepare them for success mm -hmm. in college and careers. And we know that's not always the case, yeah. and we know we have an equity problem there. The yeah. disproportionately low income students and students of color get less. Yeah. They get assigned work that is of lower quality, that is of lower rigor, and the result is they don't make the progress they need to. We complain, wherever I go around the country, people complain that we don't have enough of uh, enough graduates who are prepared for STEM careers, and yet African-American and Latino students are disproportionately likely to go to schools where you can't even take yeah. chemistry or physics or algebra too. Right, so we say we want more STEM, more folks prepared for STEM, but we aren't providing the yeah. curricular opportunities. We say we want kids to read by third grade, but we don't prioritize preparing mm -hmm. elementary school teachers and early learning teachers to teach reading based on the science of how students learn. So we have this disconnect that our aspirations don't always match the what mm -hmm. that, that teachers and students are engaged yeah. in. Well, let me follow up because you know, say 10 years ago, this was teacher, teacher quality, teacher effectiveness was a mm -hmm. huge push um, mm -hmm. by the federal government. And, you know, the research that, that Education Trust and others spotlighted that three years of a really strong teacher can take a kid who's underperforming, you know, <coughs> to overperforming or to really strong is really convincing. And you're right, 89% of school budgets are going to teachers salaries and benefits. So if we want to make progress, we have to get the teacher part of the equation right. That's great. Ten years ago, there were these state laws passed, focus on teacher evaluation and requiring that teachers, you know, be accountable for, for student learning, that what you get graded on as a teacher and evaluated on as a teacher is whether or not your kids are actually learning and whether or not there's growth happening in a classroom. Um, something like 40 states passed laws to that effect. Mm -hmm. Did that make a difference? Has that helped? And if not, what what do we need to do to to further strengthen the effectiveness of our teachers? Yeah, I, I, I would say there are some places where teachers are getting more feedback than they were before mm -hmm. about their teaching, and that is a good thing. Uh, you have some leaders like Pedro and Janice who are using. Uh, the information we have about teacher performance to drive good professional mm -hmm. development, that is a good thing. But in the net, it hasn't had the impact that I think the architects of those policies hope for, for a few reasons. One is, uh, it's, it, just telling people they aren't doing a good job is not very helpful if they don't know what else to be doing. And so if you, if you don't tackle teacher preparation and teacher training and teacher professional development and principal quality, just giving someone a rating alone isn't going to move yeah. their performance. 
Uh, but the other is, I think teachers rightly reacted against a system that felt like it was defining success too narrowly to just how do kids do on the English and math test that was given on three days in a particular school year. And I think all of us who are involved in the teacher effectiveness efforts around the country have to acknowledge that whether intended or not, that was the message people heard. And if the people who are going to be a part of a evaluation and professional development system reject it, it's never going to work. Um, I, I tend to agree um, that the results are mixed. Um, but a few, few points on that that I'd like to just clarify or, or add to. Number one, I started teaching um, in 1999. So this was before that. but. In the beginning stages of a lot of reforms, and you know, I always say I think the school where I worked, we were subject, subjected to every single reform that you know somebody dreamt up. So I know a lot about <laughs> reform at the ground level. Um, but what I will say um, that was positive about teacher evaluation uh, policy changes is that it did, in my opinion, help to professionalize teaching a lot more. I know some people disagree with that, but as a person that was working extremely hard in the classroom, who Re, re, did not receive the kind of feedback that I provided as a principal um, for 11 years. I think I would, I've, I would always tell my teachers I was an okay teacher, I was a great principal because the feedback and that support just wasn't there. And if you think about the work that teachers do every day, first of all, it's extremely difficult, it's extremely lonely, and to think that you are an expert in something after doing it for one year or two years or three years is ridiculous. You would not expect that in any other field or profession. So why is that okay in public education? It is not and it shouldn't be. And so we have to find the right balance between making sure that teachers are treated like professionals across the board, not just from an evaluation standpoint, from a compensation standpoint and the other places. But the work that teachers do is so important that I do believe that it was necessary to start making it um, you know, have, having more weight and, and being seen as more important. I think the other um, positive thing that has come out of it is we and CPS adopted the Charlotte Danielson framework, which is much more comprehensive and has different domains that I think most educators would agree are things that teachers should be focused on. Um, how that is used varies widely, and that's where the role of the principal comes in, because I think teacher evaluation can be a transformational and powerful tool for a teacher, and more importantly, the students that are in their classes. But if the principals aren't adequately trained and prepared, and they use that tool to browbeat teachers or to make what is already one of the most difficult jobs more um, unbearable, I think you see some of the negative reactions that we saw around teacher evaluation. But personally, working in both settings where I personally as a teacher felt little accountability to go into a system where there was much more accountability, I think it has benefited Chicago public schools um, because the district is much more of an accountable district than it was when I was a student in this district and definitely when I started out as a teacher. That's just my personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to add on to that, um, one of the things I've learned about, about our teachers, so in our district, when our district was performing so low, one of the things I realized, um, so one was there was an issue around expectations. We weren't holding ourselves as adults accountable enough but what I also learned from my teachers is they, they lost their confidence. Mm -hmm. And so and many times when you're in when such difficult schools, I mean, there's many difficult schools here in Chicago, there's very difficult schools in San Antonio, where the challenges the children have are just overwhelming. And our teachers, and I always tell this to everybody, our schools see everything. They see when our parents are getting divorced. They see when their parents can't afford food. I mean, just the stories I could share with you, I mean, would, would just, it just it's overwhelming. And what I've learned over the last four years, we started working with teachers. We elevated them. We created what we call a master teacher initiative, which these are our strongest teachers. We paid them more. Uh, we work with them. We have them now lead our professional development. We just did a, a survey. 70% uh, of my teachers district-wide now uh, have had, you know, in, in terms of how they feel about their school, their learning environment, their, their, their principal, the direction of the district has never been higher. Mm -hmm. And what I learned is that we started building their confidence up. Mm -hmm. They started seeing that this is possible. They became very data-driven. Data Unfortunately, Texas is a very state-driven, you know, test-driven kind of state. But what we're also doing is we're bringing in project-based learning. We are training our teachers on how to let the children just be children, literally in preschool. Let them just play. Let them explore things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing some amazing creativity happening. 
And, and, and what we're doing is we're, we're trying to help teachers just find their confidence and, 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 to, and, and really help them to be more empowered. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's still early, but I'll tell you, for me, um, we're seeing the results from it. And, and I, we, we know we're going to be starting, we're starting testing just right now, but my, school, my teachers have never have felt better about the possibilities than they have today. Mm -hmm. And these are, like I said, children with very difficult poverty conditions. And so for me, if it can happen in San Antonio, it can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Incredibly exciting. Um, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of uh, controversy in the education world about the DeVos, you know, Secretary DeVos and the change, the changes from the Obama administration to the Trump administration in terms of educational priorities and what it's doing and what it's rolling back. Um, the feds give you less than 10% of your money as district superintendents, but they still exert a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, do you feel a difference for all the sturm and drang about, you know, people who object to the, the administration's priorities, do you feel a difference on the ground, or has it been sort of like, you know, a bit of a distraction, head down on the work, and it doesn't really affect us that much? I would say more of the latter. I mean, this is Chicago, so you know how we operate a little bit. But um, seriously, I think some of the things, we, we've come so far and in, are much more of a progressive place than some of the policies of the current administration. You know, two examples would be our uh, focus on restorative justice um, and, um, you know, just getting rid of zero tolerance disciplinary strategies. And we've seen that work. So it's not all about accountability with regard to test scores, but alongside those changes that we've made, we've also changed our policies around discipline in our students. We have prioritized social emotional learning. When the district was going through its greatest financial crisis, we didn't cut a single um, dollar out of our SEL department at the district level. So we've made those commitments and despite those changes that have come out at the top, CPS's policies will continue um, to go beyond what's expected. Another example is around um, Title IX initiatives where some of those things mm -hmm. are being walked back or looked at um, in a different way. And we have our own struggles as a school system that we've been addressing head on. And we have no intentions of just meeting that low bar. And so I think that those things serve as maybe guidelines um, for all districts, but it's kind of the lowest bar. And as a school system, it's always based on our values and the values of the city that we're in. And so at CPS, we're going to keep doing what we think is right, um, despite what, what may be coming from the top. Yeah, just to add on to what Janice said, I think part of our role uh, is to always uh, create a filter for our schools. And, and so I, I think Chicago has done this very well. We've done it very well in San Antonio that regardless of what's happening politically, whether it's nationally, sometimes even locally, um, I'm always amazed that when you do that well, schools, principals, teachers, they focus on what matters most, which is the children in their classrooms. And for me, uh, one of the things that we preach a lot is that the problem solving has, has to be local. Um, so regardless of what could happen nationally, we, we watch that. We watch what's happening at the state level as well. We're a very big state. Uh, Texas is the second largest state in the country, and there's always all kinds of crazy laws that people are trying to pass, and we're always trying to block them. But at the end, what we tell our teachers and our principals, you guys focus on the work in your school. Mm -hmm. uh, because frankly, that's more than enough for you, and so we will, we will block and tackle everything else. Um, and, and frankly, I, I feel that you know, that's how you know, we can survive. I mean, like I said, there's been crazy things that happen in Chicago, there's crazy things that happen in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and yet our schools continue to focus on the right work. John, are, there a, couple of, are there a couple of things that felt dagger to the heart? In yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh. <laughs> well, I think this is both the, the hope and the risk, right? So at the moment, the hopeful thing is that you have good leaders at the local level who essentially ignore the negative, harmful policies of the administration and keep doing the right mm -hmm. thing. But the problem with civil rights enforcement, and ultimately the Federal Education Department is a civil rights agency, the problem with civil rights enforcement is that it's really about the people who aren't doing the right thing. Yeah. And so I, you know, I love the way that, that Janice and Pedro are leading in their communities, and we have places that when the federal government backs away from trying to address discipline disparities, they use suspension and expulsion more frequently with students of color. We know that African-American kids are more than three times likely to be suspended from school as white kids. We know that starts as early as pre-K. African-American kids are 18% of the kids in pre-K, 48% of the kids suspended from pre-K, four-year-olds sent home from school, told school is not for you, right? That gets worse when you have a lack of, of federal enforcement. 
we know that there are college presidents who are going to keep doing the right thing, keep protecting their students from sexual assault, and we know that there are colleges that are going to bury sexual assault um, allegations, that are going to ignore environments rife with sexual harassment in the absence of federal civil rights enforcement. And so at, at the moment we sort of celebrate this new progressive federalism, it's great that we have individual cities and states that are doing the right thing, but we've got to worry yeah. mm -hmm. that if you look over the course of American history, states' rights and civil rights do not go together. Mm. Civil rights enforcement requires federal leadership, and we don't have it. Yeah. Wow. At the federal level, over the next year or two, what are the key policy um, debates looming or developments that are gonna that people in this room should watch for as being really high stakes for mm -hmm. our schools? Yeah. Well, one of the biggest is is the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, mm -hmm. right? And that's not directly a K-12 issue, but it has big implications yep. for K-12. Mm -hmm. right? We want our students to leave us and go on to post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. They have very little chance of being successful in the 21st century economy without post-secondary education. And there's real risk. The administration has used their time in office to try to resuscitate the for-profit higher ed industry that is essentially a large-scale scam, mm -hmm. a, a series of scams that have been perpetrated against students, leaving them with debt and no degrees, yeah. uh, or degrees that are meaningless. It's not every for-profit that's a bad actor, but a lot of them are. Um, disproportionate share of the students who default on their debt are coming from those for-profit schools. And that has been the single-minded focus of the administration, to expand those schools, to dismantle enforcement efforts that we made in the Obama administration. The Higher Education Act reauthorization is an opportunity to rein that back in mm -hmm. for Congress to step up and lead. We also have a college completion crisis. We have too many students who start and don't finish. Mm -hmm. So every 10 uh, white students who start college start a four-year bachelor's program. Only six will have graduated six years later for uh, Latino students, five out of 10 for African-American students, four out of 10. And if you leave school and you owe money, you are trapped because you can't get a good job because you don't have a degree, so you can't pay the money back, you default, and you can't re-enroll in school, you're just trapped. And we've got to invest in the supports necessary for low-income students and students of color, not just to go to college, but to get through with meaningful degrees. Mm -hmm. Higher Ed Act reauthorization could advance that, or not. Mm -hmm. The other piece I would say is you know, the administration has systematically been dismantling the civil rights enforcement capacity of the, not only the federal education department, it's true across mm -hmm. agencies. In housing, uh, they've taken a similar approach. Health and human services. Uh, there's a real effort to undermine civil rights enforcement. Mm -hmm. And the long-term implications are that we will see more harm to low-income students, to students of color, to LGBTQ young people. It's very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and again, Congress could step up mm -hmm. in important ways here to counteract some of that. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go to questions in a few minutes. I, I have one question for you, Janice, which is at the local level, one of the big changes, we've got a new mayor, mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the signature features of Chicago's education system for over 100 years has been that we have had an appointed school board, a, a school board appointed by the mayor, so the mayor you know, the argument is that a mayor, if he's on the hook for how well the schools are doing, should have the opportunity to have his school's chief and or her school's chief and her board mm -hmm. working in concert to pursue a particular vision. Um, the critics say that uh, you know, an appointed school board excludes the community from decision making. Mm -hmm. Do you think, it looks like now this, that our new mayor is going to be supportive of moving to an appointed school board and that they're, sorry, an elected school board and there is momentum public momentum for that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if we do have an elected school board, um, that will help or hinder your ability to effectively pursue your, <laughs> your agenda? Well, a couple of things. First, we have to look at the progress that CPS has made under an appointed school board. And I think that this is a healthy debate, a debate that needs to happen, but it can't be one-sided and it can't be out of frustration. And I think that it is very popular. Um, we've all, we know that. But I think that there needs to be, um, it needs to be thoughtful, however we do this, because there has been tremendous progress made under 
um, an appointed um, school board and have a mayoral control. So I think that's what, number one. I also think there are lessons to be learned from other school systems that have elected school boards that we have to guard against. I mean, we just had an election where 30% of eligible voters came out to vote for the mayor. So how many people do we think are going to come out and vote for elected school boards? When I hear a call for elected school boards, what I hear from people is frustration around the lack of transparency around what's happening. And as a school system, we've tried to improve that um, by streaming our meetings, um, you know, within uh, the district, we're moving to do that more publicly, being more transparent before we make decisions, even though sometimes that causes more um, noise, if you will, but making mm -hmm. apparent what we're doing a year out so that there is enough time for public debate and discourse around that before uh, a final decision is made. But I think we also need to make sure we don't run down this rabbit hole and see it as a panacea when there are other school systems that have done something similar and what you end up with are very expensive um, elections that don't benefit children, in my opinion, um, directly. You see more bureaucracy, more offices, and more um, self-interest that have to be dealt with. And I just want to make sure that whatever Chicago uh, ultimately does, and I do know that changes on the horizon, what that will look like is going to play out over the next um, you know, coming months or coming years under this new administration, what that will look like will, will really be based on how well we work with the General Assembly, the community advocates, and et cetera. But I just want to make sure people understand it's not a silver bullet. It has to be done in a thoughtful way. And we have to really get at what the ultimate goal is, which is more transparency and more involvement from the community. The last thing we want is more politicians or people who are protecting the interests of uh, rich and powerful people on our school boards. If an elected school board means a single mom from Inglewood is going to be on the school board for Chicago Public Schools, sign me up. But we know what this usually looks like. And so we have to put in systems and structures that guard against that so that real people whose children are in the system have an opportunity to lead and govern and that it doesn't become a place where special interest and money is determining who's sitting on those boards. So personal opinion, I think it's the right direction if people, if, if it's going to be real, but we have to be careful about that and not see it as a silver bullet. Okay. Uh, one, one, one last quick question for you, Pedro. You are um, the children of immigrants. You emigrated here when you were five from Mexico. This is obviously a really hot topic right now. Um, you are near the border. Uh, again, sort of what does, what does it feel like on the ground in your district? Is immigration a challenge for the district? Mm -hmm. Um, or is it, again, more of a noisy national yeah. Twitter conversation it, it, than, very, than reality on the ground? It's very difficult, especially San Antonio, Austin. Most of the urban cities in Texas are blue cities, and they, they, and they are very pro-immigrant rights. And so, for example, in our district, we've trained all of our counselors. We provided training to teachers and parents about their rights. Um, always at risk, always at risk that, that I could have somebody, uh, and we also build relations with the governor and the lieutenant governor who have been very anti-immigrant. And so it's a very difficult uh, tightrope to walk. Mm -hmm. We're getting several, uh, several, stu uh, several children now from the Honduras coming into my district now that, that we're serving, and, and it's difficult for my principals because some of these children are much older, they haven't had any education at all, they're worried about accountability. And so, and so we see it, you know, on, on different, from different perspectives. Uh, but as you said, you know, I myself am a, am a son of, you know, I, I came from Mexico when I was five, and I strongly, my wife and I both strongly are passionate about immigrant rights. Um, but in a state like Texas, you know, we have to be, you know, we always have to be very careful on how we manage that. My board is very pro-immigrant, so we do what we can. At the same time, we try not to um, put our families at risk because we've, mm -hmm. we have several raids that happen across most of the cities in Texas. Wow. And so I always tell my board, it's great for you to get on a speakerphone and talk about you know, your passion for immigrant rights, but if all you're doing is bringing attention to create more raids, I'd rather you don't do it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather we work behind the scenes because the best thing we can do for these children is get them educated, get them a high school diploma, get them a DACA status, get them into college. Yeah. Okay, it's time for questions. Chase? Hi, my name is Chase Leithu, and I'm a first year at the college, um, thinking about studying public policy and sociology. And um, I have a sort of a two-part question. So um, I'm from Arizona, where like one of the we have like one of the highest like disproportions between uh, college counselors and um, students. Um, so I was wondering, what are some ways you guys uh, envision? Um, better training counselors so they're, they can assist students 
-hmm. with college readiness and resources that they can uh, that they can utilize, and also what are some ways uh, you want to see this sort of gap be closed between mm -hmm. um, legislation and education. Mm -hmm. um, I can start on the um, college uh, counselor piece. What, well, first of all, if we had you know, all of the money in the world, we would definitely want to ensure that the ratio between co college counselors and students matched all best practices. I think CPS does a lot of great work um, in this area, but obviously you know, still a challenge. Some of the things that we've done to kind of mitigate that and make sure that our students have you know, access to counselors is to really take things off of their plate. So um, uh, at the elementary level and the high school level, making sure that testing, coordination, and things like that are more optional. In, in the past, it used to be just mandatory and a part of your job as a guidance counselor because you were, um, you know, not in the classroom. And so really making sure that principals and everybody understands that their primary focus and primary role is to provide guidance counselor um, support for children. We've also tried to leverage technology in ways so that we provide our counselors with resources and tools that make their jobs easier. So using tools like Naviance, which is like an online system to help with the college application process. We have things we've done with student enrollment um, because we have a large choice system. So really just trying to use technology to take away some of the burden that I know counselors had in the past to you know, make sure I have John's profile and Pedro's profile down before I sit down and have a conversation with you. And then the last thing I'll say that's been unique here in Chicago is that we have an amazing philanthropic community and university community that rallies around Chicago public schools and works in concert and toward the same thing. Um, so they provide additional resources, tools, research. In some cases, those resources include individuals who may be college students or recent graduates who are working in our schools as post-secondary specialists, so they can provide some of the you know, initial work, helping kids with the research part of the process and taking away some of the duties that the counselor may have later on down the road. But in CPS, we see um, guidance counseling as an uh, you know, important part of a school, um, so much so that counselors are part of the foundation position. So every single school has at least a counselor, um, but we would obviously like to see our ratio better align with um, best practices, and that's something we continue to work on. And for us, um, because I made my bet on college, I mean, and I was very explicit about it with the community, we went and got philanthropy uh, because they were funding charter schools, and we have, and some of our charter operators have amazing college programs yeah. where they actually track the children all the way through college. And I went, I went to find out, like, what are they doing? How are they, how are they doing it? I found out that they were getting millions of philanthropy. So I went to the philanthropy community. and said, "Well, give us a chance because I have scale. They don't have scale. For their hundred graduates, I have twenty-five hundred graduates. Mm -hmm. And so I said, at least give us, give us an initial investment. And so we got." Um, an $8 million investment from, one, from the Valero Foundation, where we have now college, uh, going, uh, college advisors at every comprehensive high school. And then, and then we didn't stop there. We also brought in retired counselors. We brought in financial aid experts. Mm -hmm. I'm now working some consultants that are really good with SAT and getting kids into tier one universities. Because what I realize is that my families, they just don't know, mm -hmm. like my parents didn't know. And so if I have to replicate that, then I'll replicate it. And, and it is very expensive. Uh, I get worried about how I'm going to sustain it, but right now we have the funding at least for the next three years, mm -hmm. and so I'm just going to have to keep, you know, working hard to continue to raise more money for that. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm Paige. I'm also a first year. Um, I'm actually from Comal Independent School District. It's really close by to San Antonio, and I have a question that's kind of more specific to you, uh, mm -hmm. similar to the answer you just gave. So San Antonio is going to start partnering with outside entities to be included in the school system running 22, 23 schools. I wondered how you're going to balance the demands of that and the day-to-day like -day operations of schools, especially the relationships among teachers who might not agree with that. Sure. And then how do you see preserving the neighborhood schools that have been intergenerational in many neighborhoods, the historic schools that have been shutting down recently? Sure, sure. So it's a great question. So one of the things we did in Texas so first of all, charter operators get about anywhere between $1,400 to $2,000 more per student in our state because charters were really something our state wanted. Uh, and they've been a big, big supporter of charter operators. Um, and so one of the things that we were able to do, even though we're not the largest district in the state, is we were able to pass legislation that said, if I partner with a charter operator, a nonprofit, 
or a university, I can get that same difference in funding. And for us folks, that's about a 14% increase in my funding. I get about 9,000 per student. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is, so we did it what John would call a third way. So instead of outsourcing, what I did is I said, well, I still want the teachers to be our, our staff. They have our contracts. Our principals have our contracts. They're our staff. Mm -hmm. But I will partner with a not-for-profit that lets us control enrollment, because I won't let anybody pick and choose which kids to serve. Mm -hmm. So they have to serve special needs kids, English language learners. Um, they also have to you know, meet our values about what we believe about raising expectations for children. And in these partnerships, these are partnerships that we've been working with already. So for example, one of them is High Scope. High Scope is the premier curriculum for early childhood in the nation. Uh, they're, they're based in Michigan. And we had, we had been working with them in many of my schools, and we said to them, we said, hey, would you like to go deeper with us? Because if you go deeper with us, we can sustain these kind of programs with this significant additional funding. And then we limit how much of a management fee they can take. So that's what we're doing. Um, we got our schools to vote. And so I had over, uh, over 80 to 90% of my parents and my teachers voted in favor of these partnerships. I still, that 10 to 20% is still angry at me because they still didn't like it. Um, so that's something I have to manage through. Um, and, and for me, you know, what I, what I tell my community is hold me accountable. You know, if these schools are not sustaining their programs and continuing to perform well, then, you know, hold us accountable. But our board at the end, if the, if the performance isn't there, they can dissolve those agreements at any point in time. It is the funding, though, and I'm not hiding it, that, you know, it is the funding that we're pursuing because when you're in a high poverty community like mine, every single dollar counts. Um, it just does, and, and unfortunately, I, I find myself just, you know, again, anywhere I can find to get more funding for my schools, I do it. Good afternoon, my name is Rodrigo Estrada. I'm a second year student at the college studying economics and political science, and my question is also for you, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, and I'm a yeah. product of Texas public schools. Yeah. Um, and as I'm sure you recently heard, um, the Texas legislator has made school finance reform a top priority. They recently passed a school finance bill. Uh, but is it enough? Because the Texas Supreme Court said that the school finance system as it is is barely sufficient for students. Yeah. Um, what are your opinions on the lack or lack thereof of action on the state legislator? And do you see, um, kind of building off the, your previous response, um, charter schools as an answer um, to these resource constraints? Uh, given that you can qualify for additional funding per student through charter school partnerships? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so we can, part, we can uh, get the funding either through charters, but also universities or, or not-for-profits. And so for me, I'm asking universities and not-for-profits, like, step up, you know? Uh, we already work with, with many of them. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of the funding reform, so right now Texas is below the national average. Uh, it's, in, it's about 42nd out of 50 states. By the way, when I was here in Chicago, Chicago was 49th out of 50. Nevada Illinois. was 50th. Still. Illinois. Uh, well, but, but I'm saying we're still there, but it's but, Illinois. But, but at least now Illinois, <laughs> Illinois yeah. now has gotten to the average on a per pupil spending. Um, of course, there's cost of living differences, and, and you know there's a lot of other challenges. Um, I do think that this is a funding in the, going in the right direction. What really gets me excited about what they're doing is they're finally now acknowledging poverty in a different way. So they're using our, our poverty analysis that we developed in San Antonio, and they're gonna apply it statewide. So they're gonna look at median income, you know, family status, whether somebody owns a home, the college, the education level of the adults, and they're gonna start applying more funding based on that. What I love, though, is the transparency of it. So going back to charters, um, I don't mind charter operators. Hey, bring them on. We brought them in Chicago, too. Bring them on. I don't mind that. I, but you know, what I don't appreciate is when organizations pick and choose their kids. When, they don't, when they're not equitable in how they, they do things. And so for us, uh, what I love about this, you know, with this new, within this new funding bill, there's a, people, are, we're gonna know who's serving what type of children. Because folks, free and reduced lunch, which has been around for decades and decades, is so outdated. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. In Texas, 60% of the children qualify for free and reduced lunch. In Chicago, it's 82%, down from 87 when I was here. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't mean very much because the poverty in Inglewood very different mm -hmm. than the poverty in other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And they can still be free and reduced lunch eligible. You can live in the north side and still be free and reduced lunch eligible. Mm -hmm. It's just based on how many children you have. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, you know, for us, that's what I find exciting. I think it's a good start. And I'm hoping 2020, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm hoping we can build on it. You know, hopefully, because one of the reasons they're putting so much funding is because Beto ran and, and got so close. And because of that, the legislature got more moderate. Mm -hmm. And so there is something to that. Quick, quick follow-up, speaking of 2020, since you opened the door, um, uh, have any of the Democratic presidential contenders uh, impressed you so far with their education plans, proposals? I mean, who, who do you think is most compelling 
so you far on <laughs> education. <laughs> so here to make news. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> John endorses. Well, right, exactly. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to endorse any particular candidate, but I will say I appreciate that Senator Warren has been particularly specific mm -hmm. about policy proposals, both what she would do and where the resources would come from. Um, you know, so she's been very clear on a proposal for universal child care paid for from a tax on wealth that she's proposed. Uh, we know how much learning takes place between zero and three. Yeah. And I appreciate that she has put on the table the reality that in the wealthiest country in the world, we could move towards universal child care if we were willing to make the investment. Yeah. You could dispute the details of her proposed methodology for doing it or the proposed source of funding, but she's exactly right that we do have the resources to do it if we want to. Today she put out a proposal around both how she would pay for a vision for tuition-free college yeah. and a vision for addressing uh, the crushing impact of student debt on students. Again, one could, one could disagree with some of the details, but I appreciate her taking the position that as a country with so much wealth, we ought to be thinking yeah. about education not as an expense, but as an investment. Right. Um, my hope is that we will see other candidates try to match her specificity. I also should give credit to uh, Kamala Harris oh, yeah. for putting out a very specific proposal mm -hmm. around teacher compensation. Mm -hmm. I, I hope this is a debate about ideas and not just about tweets, yeah. right? We need people to articulate what they would do differently to address our competitive standing in the world. And I appreciate that Senator Warren and Senator Harris are at least beginning to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming here from out of town. Janice, it's a pleasure to see you. My name's Kenneth Newman. I'm involved in school reform. I happen to have some expertise in Title IX. If, in case you weren't aware, Chicago has a very ugly history of Title IX violations. Mm. Um, I've been involved with that, uh, also in another school district. Mm -hmm. I also work in the sport of soccer. In Texas, I'm very curious to know, are there a lot of these independent school districts whose Title IX uh, violations are enormous, or are they being cut down? How is the Texas legislature and both local, state, and federal prosecutors, are they looking at this? It's a great question. I think it goes back to what John said. I mean, without a lot of pressure from the federal government, mm -hmm. um, you, you know some of these violations probably exist out there. I, I will say this. I, I am, I've been very impressed with the state overall in terms of how much they invest in athletics and extracurriculars. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the things that I, you know, when I saw how much, you know, we invested in the state, um, you know, it reminded me back to Chicago because I remember Arnie would tell me about how, you know, every time we had, you know, budget optimizations, you know, we would, we would look at athletics and be like, mm -hmm. we're only spending $10 million. Mm -hmm. And Arnie's like, you know, it's 10 million for the entire district. I mean, mm -hmm. and you consider that, I mean, compared to what other districts spend in Texas, it's, you know, we spend quite a bit more. I, I do feel that um, there is a good effort to try to reduce those issues. I mean, I do see a lot of sports. I mean, I know in my district, every sport that we have for boys, we have for girls. The bigger issue for us is always just making sure we have equitable playing spaces. Mm -hmm. So that that is a you know, and that that is more you know, again in inner cities where you have you know where real estate is. At and, and are your principals and athletic directors are they complying or are they sort of out of yes, whack? Yes, they, they are complying, and and but like I said, I also think there's always more pressure needed from the mm -hmm. feds as well. I do want to add that CPS is in compliance now, Mr. Newman, so do we have I, to know uh, that? I just found out something today that you need to know about. Okay. Well, we're in compliance thanks to the Civil Rights Office, so they are enforcing that, so we're happy about that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Guadalupe Vargas. I'm actually an alumni from CPS um, High School. I went to school in a majority Latinx school on the far southeast side. Okay. Um, and so my question is revolving the segregation that both of you mentioned, um, or all of you mentioned, like, in the country faces. So CPS has, like, a very racial segregation that we have very economically wise. And then you mentioned San Antonio has a very, like, class-based segregation. And so I'm wondering, like, you know, there's a, also, like, a big, um, what, like, let me get back my train of thought train of thought. So I'm wondering how much 
the, that this segregation impacts the schools for like mm -hmm. how you think this impacts like the schools for like the everyday of the students. Mm -hmm. So just me going to school, like I sort of always knew that my school on the far south side, based on because we got our funding based on property taxes, that my school was always like underfunded in comparison to schools maybe located in higher property taxes. So I'm wondering like what are districts' initiative to like take charge of like the segregation and the like the disparity when it comes to like funding in schools to make sure that students that go to I think you mentioned difficult schools have make sure that they get more resources in order because like they need more in order to more succeed. So I'm just wondering like stances on that, so, um, so district wise, yeah. country wise. So a couple of things that I'm really proud of that we're, that we feel that are gonna be good lessons hopefully for the future for other districts. So first of all, I was here in Chicago when we created many of the magnet programs. Yeah. And, and there was a specific purpose. It was to bring back the middle class. I mean, it was the mayor was a, gave a charge to Arnie and said, I'm tired of losing middle class families to the suburbs. And so the charge was bring them back keep them. That was the charge. So that's how Walter Payton got created. That's how Northside Prep got created, on and on and on. Lessons learned, mm -hmm. right? When I went to San Antonio, and there I got to create more what I call choice programs or magnet programs. So, so one of the things we, we decided early on, we would never allow any of our schools to go below 50% poverty, mm -hmm. and none of them ever have. And we have now 11 what we call choice programs, choice schools, about 30 choice programs. We also reserve seats for the poorest of the poor. These are my families that make a median income of $20,000, single parent households. Again, adults are not educated. You know, they don't own their own home. And so 25% uh, of the slots are just for those families. And by the way, they're very quiet. They don't say anything. They're, they feel like they won the lottery and they just literally don't even, they don't even peek out. It's amazing what I'm watching in my schools because I have children that are homeless and are in foster care with children that are now the daughters and sons of, of professors or, or executives. It creates amazing conversations about poverty. Um, you know, it, it, one of the things that I, you know, and it's just amazing what my teachers do. So, so one of my school, one of the schools, they went to the zoo, and they, you know, they they put a rule that none of the children could go buy anything. And I thought that's kind of weird. You know, that's kind of cruel. Like, you know, you see the store, why can't they go buy something? Well, it's because we have children that are homeless, and they cannot afford to go buy a ten dollar, twenty dollar gift. Whereas there's other families that they can afford to buy a hundred dollar gift. Mm -hmm. And so my schools say we're not going to allow that. All my schools have uniforms all through high school because I will not have a child worry about what they're gonna wear that day and whether they're gonna be made fun of. We have college days and we have free dress days and all those kind of things, but for the most part, they wear uniforms. Mm -hmm. And so for us, you know, we're, we're learning a lot and, for the, and when we did our, our teacher survey this year, my, in my difficult schools, for the first time, we closed the gap of how teachers felt about their workload, how they felt about uh, meeting the challenges, how they felt about the learning. First time we closed that gap with everybody feeling the best they've ever felt about the district. But what I felt proud of was that when I saw those schools, because those were my lowest schools where teachers were leaving, they felt overwhelmed, they felt they weren't getting enough support, and we closed the gap for the first time. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this experiment has been called, I think, the most radical socioeconomic integration experiment in the country, and the work that you're doing is really path-breaking. There's a great article, I think it's in the 74, mm -hmm. that profiles this in depth for anybody who wants to see what cutting-edge work looks like in this space on socioeconomic. Thank you. And also, Pedro will be talking about it tomorrow in the seminar. Yes, at um, 12.30 um. at the <laughs> Institute of Politics. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? On the, I mean, on the, yeah. a couple of things. I think, number one, when we have a conversation around budgeting, it, equity is the, the biggest issue. Um, and I think also the facts around that. I mean, property taxes do pay a lion's share, but they are not distributed based on zip code. It's actually equally distributed throughout the city, but that's not sufficient. Because if you actually do a per pupil analysis, in many of our underperforming schools and under enrolled schools, we actually spend in some cases twice per twice the per pupil amount, the average per pupil amount throughout the city because of under enrollment and some of the other issues that have been um, you know, made worse by our enrollment trends. I think what we have to have a conversation about is what equity really looks like, which is why I'm really excited about the evidence-based funding model that the state now uses um, that we are moving towards in, in the district. But one of the things, I was thinking about this um, when the um, gentleman from El Paso spoke earlier, we really have to have a real conversation about funding public education in the state of Illinois, because these discussions around what the north side gets versus the south side, district schools versus charter schools, I think it's all a red herring. At the end of the day, CPS funding adequacy is at 62%. That means that the state of Illinois is funding us at 62% of what the adequate, it's a very important word, that's not even superb, that's adequate 
funding level. If this, if Chicago Public Schools, as well as the rest of the district uh, districts throughout the state, were funded at 100%, CPS will receive an additional two billion dollars in our operating budget. We wouldn't have to have a conversation about who gets an annex counselors, those types of things. I mean, obviously there will still be challenges, but they wouldn't be as great as they are. I think when you layer on top of that segregation and the cost of segregation that's associated with that, I think it makes the problem more pronounced. The one thing that I wanna challenge us to think about, not only as a city, but a country, and I know John talks a lot about this, is how do we move away from a system where your proximity to white and affluent children determines the success of your school. And a lot of kids, I grew up in the inner city, went to a predominantly African-American high school, and because of what we saw, the quality of education, and I, I got a great education, but you, you always knew the difference between what you were getting and what the perception was. And so there was always this feeling that you had to be in proximity to affluent people, white people, in order to get a high quality education. But we have some phenomenal schools right here in our communities. And so what I've tried to do is through offering more options and opportunities in the city, make people understand that there are good options in our community. And if we choose those, those will be great schools. We have to stop obsessing over five high schools in Chicago. We have uh, over 100 schools. Many of them are high quality options. Our school quality policy rating tries to be more transparent so that you can see those things. But you have a school like Brooks on 114th Street. It's a blue ribbon school. It's a high quality school. You have parents who won't go to that school because almost all of the kids are African American. That's a problem. And it's something that, it even starts in our community. I was talking backstage about taking my kids um, this weekend to, on an HBC to HBCU tour. And there are some people who would say, you know, you have the means, you have this, why would you have your kids go to a school that is noted as a historically black college when they would have access to these schools in Ivy Leagues? We have to stop obsessing over the same small group of name brand schools and really understand that you can get a high quality education. It's about how much you put into it. So I just think there's so many layers in the question that you had. It's a really great question and gets at the essence of it. But I think race and inequity is at the core of what you're talking about. And if we have to have a real conversation about what that means across the board in order to really right the wrongs that you were pointing out in your question. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Chris. Um, I'm just a fanatic of the Institute of Politics, so I come when I can. Um, thank you for coming. Thank and, you. <laughs> and um, so my question is more like a hypothetical when I oh, think about good. it. So, was it Ms. Jarrett? Ms. Valerie Jarrett was here last week. And one of the things she did was kind of wagged her fingers at the youth for not voting. Mm -hmm. So my question is more about voter engagement. Now, mm -hmm. I try to do some research. I can't get good Wi-Fi for some reason. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> there, there was a proposal for uh, reducing the voting age to 16, if I'm not mistaken. This is like a hypothetical. Now, I've, I've been at a couple of uh, mayoral forums where your name has come up, mm -hmm. and they ask about voting for a school board. Mm -hmm. And you just recently brought up about how a third of the city actually votes for our representation. I'm very upset personally that our mayor does not represent necessarily the whole city, just 500,000 voters. So how do you feel if 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds were actually able to vote for their school board mm -hmm. and how that process will actually assist them with voter engagement as your model citizen mm -hmm. once they turn 18. Like, not to be long-winded, um, I've gone through some school tours, be it alternative, be it charter, be it CPS, where you, you bring up post-secondary -sec education. Mm -hmm. They start as soon as they're freshmen. Mm -hmm. This is what you do. This is how you prepare your essay. This is how you fill out your application. So once they become juniors and they take the, the SATs, the ACTs, they're already prepared. We need to get to the question. Yeah. No, but that is the question. My question is basically but, voting at 16, okay. do you uh -huh. believe that that will help with the Thank school you. system? Well, you know, I think that's, uh, I don't know, about 16 seems a little young on the issues, um, but, you know, you can drive a car at 16, so maybe you should be able to vote. I don't know. But what I think we should do as a country, I would like to see us revisit some of the laws around 
other adults over 18 that are excluded from the voting process. These are people that have been incarcerated, people with felonies in their background. Some of these are the people who are the most, um, who have benefited or not benefited, who have actually been, you know, lost in some cases throughout the system and made bad choices and had to um, atone for that. But how do you uh, disqualify them from participating in the political process that, you know, where people are making decisions about their lives? So I think that across the country, um, there are so many places where we need to look at um, voter eligibility issues that prevent people who are of age right now from voting. And a lot of it is intentional. I mean, it goes back to some of the old tricks that were used. Um, you know, prior to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I mean, these things are done in order to make sure that there's a certain group that is not a part of the electorate. And I think that that is the conversation that I want to have, because I think somebody that's been involved in the criminal justice system is going to have a very strong opinion about um, some of the issues that a mayor, a uh, governor, et cetera, um, would preside over. And I know 16 seems a little bit young. I'm not sure if they yet have the life experiences to weigh in on that, but I'm not totally opposed to it. It's actually the first time I've ever thought about it. So, you know, <laughs> thank and you for and challenging and me just, in that way. And I would just yeah. add that, you know, one of the things that we're really pushing a lot in our district is student voice yeah. and really having students. So there was a, when, when there was going to be demonstrations from, remember when the Parkland incident happened and um, that, you know, some of my colleagues in, in Texas were going to punish kids for demonstrating, mm -hmm. and we did the opposite. Yeah. We said, no, you know, if you want to go and go into, the, and go into the auditorium and do a demonstration, do it there. If you want to go on the streets, we'll just go with you because we, we're worried about your safety. So we're going to walk with you mm -hmm. uh, wherever you're going to walk. And we did that, and, it was, and one of the things that I really saw for my kids is that they're very socially conscious. They know what's happening around them. And sometimes, as adults, we don't allow them to, to just voice their, their feelings. And so I think, you know, definitely in, 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 our, uh, in our district, uh, when the children turn 18, um, my uh, high school principals are all authorized to, uh, to get them registered. Yeah. And so we registered them right there on the spot. And then uh, in my poorest high school, my board president and the community walked with all the students that turned 18 to vote in the last election because mm -hmm. Texas is not a, a blue state or a red state. It's a non-voting state. If mm. all the cities really uh, had a better turnout, it would actually be a city that would be very similar to California. Um, and so for us, you know, the way we're trying to change that without getting into any politics is just saying, look, exercise your voice, whether it's voting or just being vocal about what you feel. Mm -hmm. So that is a perfect segue to my very last uh, question. I know we're just about at time, so I'll just ask for quick responses from both of you, from all of you. Um, our mission here at the Institute of Politics is to inspire and prepare the next generation of students to go into public service, very broadly defined. There are lots of seats around the public service table. You all have achieved um, incredible success and, and influence and an opportunity to change millions of people's lives for the better. Um, for those of our students here who might look at you and think, I want to do something like what they're doing and go on to become leaders in education, practice, or policy, what, what is your, the essence of your career advice that you would give to them? Become a teacher. I was about to say. I, mean, I, 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 I hope as many of the students as possible uh, become teachers. I am I'm so grateful for the opportunity to participate in the IOP seminar and get to spend time with students mm -hmm. and to be able to teach at University of Maryland where I teach now. It's, a, it's the, part of the most valuable and one of the most valuable and fulfilling experiences I've had. And teaching high school civics and social studies was about strengthening our democracy. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that many of you will choose teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add to that, there's so many great opportunities now with Teach for America. We have residency programs now that you know you don't have to even have a, a, a undergrad in education, and and the teachers are needed so much. But what I see is many of you know some become you know they stay teachers and they're amazing teachers. Some be, uh, open up their own non for profits. They they do other policy work. Uh, but what's great now is there's never been more opportunities now with all these different programs that are very high quality uh, for you to be able to get into that work. And whether it's in Chicago or in San Antonio, anywhere in the country, uh, those programs exist. And so just know, and, they, and frankly, you know, my teachers start at $50,000 a year, $52,000 a year. And so you know, they're not, I mean, you know, they're, they're jobs that pay well to start, uh, but what I love is that we're, you know, we're, we're growing leaders. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the founder of one of those teacher residency programs is sitting in the front row, and some of our other champions of, of education and terrific teacher programs are in the third row. And I just want to say there are immense opportunities yeah. for students here in Chicago to get involved in teaching. So come see me or come see Janice afterwards if you want to learn how. Clearly, um, America's school children are so lucky to have had these three people sitting in their seats uh, over their careers, and we are lucky to have had you with us tonight. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.